Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. So I have to apologize up front. I don't have anything near as cool as reducing a testicular torsion in my lecture. <laughs> I, I wish yes. I would have known that's what I was following. <laughs> I'm going to come to quiz you later and we'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so I know a lot of you have probably seen most of this in the past. It, it's a great review. For those of you that are new, this is some really good, important educational material. Um, by no means am I an expert. If you guys have uh, something that you think will contribute, please, please share that with the group. So we're going to talk about uh, some helicopter safety, about uh, what we need to come into your scene, and then a little bit about patient packaging. So this previous slide is what we teach people when we're coming to teach police departments and fire departments, because this is what we see. We've got more people than we know what to do with. We've got more vehicles in the way. We've got all the bystanders rushing the scene. This is what you guys are going to have. We're going to be landing on a dirt road, we're going to be landing in a field, and it's a, a completely different set of hazards. So some of the hazards we worry about landing in a city area are traffic, bystanders, road signs, fencing, garbage cans, all that stuff that you guys don't even worry about. So the things we worry about in this kind of a setting, rocks, tree stumps, all it takes is for that aircraft to come down and settle down on top of a tree stump we didn't see covered by a bush punctures the fuel tank, and we're out of service. We're done. So we really rely on you guys to help us find a nice, flat, clean landing zone. What was that? Okay, I thought I heard a question. So this is all the stuff we're going to talk about. We're going to go through all of them. The first is uh, some of our specialty teams, and I'm not including everything here. Because I really doubt you guys have a lot of neonatal emergencies on the mountainside. If you ever do have a childbirth on the mountainside, give us a call. I'll bring a neonatal nurse with me and we'll take care of the problem. But I, I don't imagine there's a lot of pregnant women getting ready to deliver up there. What about kids though? You guys probably see quite a few kids up on the mountain. And, and for our purposes, we define a child as anybody less than 14 years of age. So we have a dedicated pediatric team. These are nurses that are trained in the, the ICU or the ER at primary children's. And I would guesstimate, because I don't have hard numbers, our average pediatric nurse probably has 12 to 15 years of experience before they'll be responding with us. So they are a very valuable resource. I can tell you if it's ever my child that is hurt, that is who I want showing up. The good news is we have a pediatric nurse stationed here at Utah Valley which would be the first ship coming to your location. So if you have a pediatric emergency, please call us. This is our dispatch center. It's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can always get a hold of LifeLight. Now, do you guys work through a dispatch center? Yes. Typically, we work with dispatch. They actually be the ones that call you. Okay, so you guys call dispatch. Dispatch calls us. They have this number. We are staffed with, with two to three people, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're always ready to respond. Some of the information we need to know from your dispatch that you will have to relate to them um, are the number of patients. If I've got one victim versus three victims, that changes a lot for me. Our aircraft take one patient. So if I need multiple patients removed, I need multiple aircraft. And that's something we need to know, to know up front so we can get the right resources mobilized to your location. I need to know adult or child so that I make sure I get the right team members to your location. Uh, any local weather concerns. And we'll talk a lot more about winds in a minute, but we need to know uh, if you have poor visibility, if you have rain showers, stuff like that that's going to impede us getting to your location. If you know the patient weight, we would like that. We don't need to know that, but we would like it. Street addresses, probably not so much for you guys. <laughs> but GPS coordinates are very valuable to us. And I would imagine that you guys probably all have GPS, or a, a lot of you have GPS. If, if you can give me a GPS coordinate, we can punch that into the aircraft, and I can tell you to the minute how long it's going to take me to get there. We need to know if there's other aircraft in the area. Again, if we have multiple patients and multiple aircraft responding, we need to be able to communicate with each other. Just real quick, GPS, what standard do you use? We're, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. We, need it. We, we, we can use either. Whatever you give us, we'll convert it if we need to. 
And another one that we need to know right up front is if this is a hoist request, because that's a, a specific aircraft we need to get started. Unfortunately, it's not the Utah Valley aircraft. They'll be coming out of Ogden. So the sooner we know it's a hoist, the sooner I can get that, that aircraft headed to your location. Now this slide's slightly outdated. Um, this shows our aircraft location. We have aircraft in Ogden, Salt Lake, and Provo, and we now have one down in St. George. So we pretty much cover the entire state of Utah with rotor aircraft. We also <coughs> operate airplanes out of St. George and out of Salt Lake, and they go all over the western <coughs> United States. So this circle shows roughly a 150 mile radius. That's our, our primary response area. With our new aircraft that we've purchased in the last couple of years, that has expanded to a 175 mile radius. <coughs> So we go quite a few places. So I was talking to our pilot yesterday, I was working down here in Utah Valley, to get from our pad here to the backside of Tim, depending on weather conditions and winds, about six minutes for us. So we're pretty quick to get up there. And then you've got to understand there's a couple minutes ahead of that that it's going to take me to get to the aircraft, get the aircraft started, and get clearance to lift. But we certainly should be overhead in the 10 minute time frame from Utah Valley to your the response time from Ogden? From Ogden, you're probably going to be 40 minutes to get a hoist aircraft. And part of that, and, and we'll talk about why that, that's a delayed thing more in a minute when we get to hoist, but there's some stuff that has to happen before they ever lift to make sure that we're doing it safely. So things to consider when requesting a helicopter, or times to consider requesting a helicopter. And I, I'm so glad you just got that great lecture on what is an emergency, what needs to come off now, versus what can wait for a little while to come out by ground. Um, certainly remote locations. There may be times where, where you need us just to remove the patient from the mountain and they don't necessarily have to come down and see the dog. We do that where we will just re recover people that have gotten themselves into a position they can't get out of. Um, certainly anytime ground resources are, are overloaded. Uh, any search and rescue or hoist operations. Again, we have the only civilian operate, operated hoist program in the nation. Everybody else that does hoist rescue is either police or military. Uh, and, and we do a lot of search and rescue operations where we'll just come fly over an area and look for somebody. Uh, again, if you need a pediatric team or if you need to get somebody to a trauma center quickly, uh, burns, drownings, or the potential that that patient's going to deteriorate in the time frame it takes you to get them off the mountain. And, and I don't know, how long does it take you to get somebody off the mountain by ground? Uh, obviously, it depends on how high up the mountain they are, but it could be quite a few hours. So if this is a, a patient that you think is going to deteriorate in that time, or you start moving down the mountain and they start to deteriorate, give us a call. And we always tell people, if you just have that gut feeling, that things are gonna go bad, call us. We would rather come and not be needed and turn around and fly home than have you wish that you would have started us earlier. So there's a couple of different things you can request from us. The first is a standby. So I don't sit at the helicopter all day long waiting for you guys to call me. I've got other stuff I'm doing in the hospital. If I get a standby request, I drop what I'm doing, I walk out to the aircraft, I get my helmet ready, and I my aircraft is now dedicated to your call, and we wait to hear if you want us to go or you want us to cancel. A moving standby is when you call and request a standby, and the Provo helicopter's gone on another flight. So they may reposition our Salt Lake helicopter down here while we're waiting to hear if you need us or not. And that's a decision that is set up in the lifeline organization. If you request a standby, we may launch an aircraft to be closer. And that way, if you tell me that, you know what, I need that aircraft, we're already on the way. And if you tell me we don't, we turn around and fly home. And a launch is when you say, yep, I need that aircraft, get them coming. And we go out and, and lift off the ground. A standby doesn't really save us a lot of time, a couple of minutes. If you think you need us, put us in the air. Let us fly that direction. We'll always turn around and come home if you don't need us. Worst case scenario, I get to go on a joyride and look at some pretty scenery doesn't bother me in the slightest. Best case scenario, I'm halfway there when you guys discover that you do need us, and now we've cut that response time down. A launch will always save time over a standby. So again, if you think you might need us, launch us. We'll turn around and fly home. 
you can always cancel us, and there is no charge to the patient unless we transport them to the hospital. And that's a misconception that's out there. If you call me and I fly up there, and I'm 10 feet off the ground coming into land, and you say, hey, you know what, we're doing okay, you guys can cancel, we turn around and fly home, there's no charge to the patient. If we fly up there and somebody's been climbing and they've clipped themselves out and they can't get off, and all we do is hoist them down to the command post and they're not injured, there's no charge to the patient. If we fly up there, fly them down to the command post and decide they can go by ground ambulance, there's no charge from life life to the patient. So, so don't ever let that be part of your, your uh, decision making. So GPS. Um, again, like I talked about earlier, whatever format you guys have GPS in, give it to us. We'll convert it. The good news is most of our pilots are pretty familiar with Timpanogos and know, know a lot of the landmarks. So even if it's just a landmark you can give me, we'll get overhead. But if you have those GPS coordinates in whatever format your machine is, give them to our dispatch. They'll convert them and give them to the form we use. Do you guys have a set radio channel you use? And what kind of radios are there? Typically statewide or local. Statewide, search and rescue? Yeah, the VHF. Okay, so we've got statewide on our radios. So what we would need to know is who we're going to be talking to on statewide. And I'll dial up statewide and call whichever call sign or whoever it is I'm calling to get that, that landing zone information. We need a description of the landing zone, where you want us to land at. Sometimes it's right at the patient, sometimes it's remote to the patient, and, and we have to hike to that patient. Any hazards at the landing zone, weather conditions, and again, if there's other aircraft in the area taking off or landing. And sometimes that's just chopper five flying overhead, getting in the way. Sometimes that's other medical helicopters coming in and taking the patients. And then we'll talk about guiding in a helicopter. So some of the landing zone information I need from you guys our GPS coordinates, and any significant landmarks. Now, it doesn't help me if you say, we're right down here in the clearing where there's no trees. <laughs> well, okay, I can see 30 of them from where I am. But if you can tell us we're next to such and such landmark, we're below the cabin, we're in by this lake, that kind of stuff is helpful. And again, GPS coordinates. The hazards we need to know about are other aircraft, any poles that may be in the area. Now those can be fence poles, those can be whatever kind of marking poles are, are, are in the area. And certainly any trees could be a hazard. And then we need to know the speed and the direction of the wind. Now I don't need to know that the wind is 18 miles an hour out of the south. But if you can even tell me that it's gusting out of the south or it's intermittent or we have a steady moderate breeze from the east, whatever information you can give us so that we can approach from the right direction because we always want to land into the wind if we can. So that time we call short final when we're between 25 feet and 30 feet off the ground and that final approach into land is one of the most critical phases of flight for us and it's where we have the most problems because that's where people start running towards the aircraft or if you're a police officer driving towards the aircraft. Either way that is so critical that you guys help us maintain that safe area around our aircraft because the last thing I want to do is come into land and have somebody run at that aircraft and get hurt. Because when you're playing with an aircraft, hurt usually means dead. After the aircraft lands, stay right where you are until the rotors stop. And that's a very common mistake we see again that once those rotor blades start to slow down, that's actually the most dangerous time because the pilot loses the ability to control those. When the throttle's on, he can control the pitch of those blades. But once that throttle's off and they're just kind of free spinning, they'll, they'll dip down. And especially on these Augusta helicopters, they can dip to four and a half feet. I, I don't see anybody in here that's short enough to walk underneath that. So please be very, very cautious. Stay where you are until the rotors stop and until a crew member signals you to approach the aircraft. So landing zone requirements for us. We want firm level ground. We can operate up to a 6% grade, but the flatter the better. And we'll talk about why in, in just a minute. We ask for a 100 foot by 100 foot area. Now that's not always possible for you guys. Give us the, as much space as you can though. 
No vehicle, people, or animals within 100 feet of me and LZ. Animals, usually not a problem. They pretty much run away when we get close. People do the opposite. They run towards the aircraft. And again, we're, we're always checking for hazards. And you guys don't have a lot of wires or power lines, but uh, any poles, again, a rock, a, a tree stump that's covered by weeds, something like that can be very damaging to our aircraft. So we're going to request that somebody is our landing zone coordinator, and that's usually who I'm going to be talking to on the radio. And what we want to do is make sure that any debris is cleared. Um, we're going to mark the landing zone. Now, I don't know if you guys have any flagging tape that you can use to mark the landing zone, or if you guys carry smoke. Um, that works really well. We have that with, with ski patrol especially. Um, but some way to mark the landing zone. And again, we're going to be coordinating and talking. Lots of talking, because communication is always an issue that we can improve on. Um, as we come in, people always ask about hand signals. Really, the only one that I need you to know is, go away, don't land. If you start doing that, we're going to fly away. And, and what we assume is that something's wrong. Somebody's running into the landing zone. They found a, a new obstacle we need to take care of, something like that. Anything else, we're going to be talking on the radio to hopefully hopefully overcome that. Uh, the arms up in the air means go ahead and come on into land. But again, we're hope hopefully we have verbal communication with you as well. Please, if you have it, wear eye and ear protection. It gets very loud, very windy, and especially in the backcountry, we're going to be blowing snow and dirt and rocks and twigs and small furry animals all over the place. <laughs> and then we ask that you help us keep that aircraft secure once we are on the ground. Uh, again, backcountry, we don't seem to have as much problem as we do with ski resorts. The skiers love to try to ski under the tail of the aircraft. It drives me nuts. So night landings. We, we all wear uh, night vision goggles when we fly, and we'll talk more about those in just a moment. Please don't shine lights at our aircraft. Because we're wearing night vision goggles, when we get spotlighted, it, it just kind of ruins our um, you guys probably won't have any vehicle headlights to turn off. Could be don't. Could be sorry. Trailhead. 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 Yeah. Possibility. Absolutely. If we're landing down at the command post. Um, and again, don't approach the, the helicopter until the rotors have stopped. So night vision goggles. All of our crew members wear night vision goggles. Anytime we're lifting out of out of here after about 3 p.m., we carry those with us. So even if it's daylight hours, we may still have them, just not be using. And you can see it makes a pretty significant difference for us. With night vision goggles, it, it doesn't, it's not infrared, it doesn't show any heat, it just amplifies ambient light. So as we're flying along at night, I can tell you every spot somebody's camping because I can see the campfire. We've done search and rescues before where we've asked people just turn your cell phone on, point it up, and, and we've spotted people by cell phone light before. <clears throat> One thing that works really well and I, I, unfortunately, I don't have any to give away, but if you have even just a red laser pointer, I can see that on that side. And if you guys can tell me, I want you to land in that clearing right there, I can see that as we're approaching. Can you see the beam? I can't see the beam. It's not like I've got a, a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. But I can see the little red dot. And if you tell me, as, as we're coming in, that we, we need you on the north aspect of the slope, right here, I'll, we'll be able to see that and say, okay, I know, I know right where you guys want us to be. Do that. Great. Uh, obviously, laser pointers work best when there's little or no light. They don't work very well landing in downtown Provo because there's plenty of ambient light. But when we're at, in the back country where it's dark, again, I can tell you every campsite because I can see the fires. Uh, never point a laser directly at the aircraft. One, it ruins our night vision, but two, it's also a federal crime and you go to Big Boy Prison. And that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Uh, just point the laser at the center of where you want us to land, move it around in small circles. A moving light is easier to pick up with your eye than one that's stationary. And it's very useful in mountains, canyons, or remote areas with little or no light, which is kind of like your world. <laughs> Sounds familiar, right? Yes? Does a regular flashlight work as well? They do. Uh, the, the difference with a flashlight is that beam spreads out so much, you usually don't get that defined uh, point a distance away. 
But if you if you can just tell me I've got a flashlight and I'm waving it in the air, there's a good chance I'm going to see that. We'll we'll be able to see some illumination, but again, a flashlight beam breaks up so much. The laser pointers are, are much more defined for us. We have a couple of unique hazards landing in the backcountry: whiteout and brownout. So as we come into land, any loose snow, dirt, soil, anything like that's going to come up and can make a great big cloud. Now there are some times that we can just sit in the hover there and blow enough of that away that the pilot can see the ground again and we can come in and land. If that doesn't happen though, he's going to pull up and we're going to have to find another landing zone. So if we tell you this is not going to work, we need an alternate LZ, it's not that you guys have done anything wrong, it just may be that there's enough loose soil there, we're losing visibility and it's not worth the safety risk to continue. So helicopters, you can hear them from a long way away. Let us know over the radio when you can hear us and when you can see us. Because it's a lot easier to spot one aircraft in the air than for me looking down over the terrain to try to pick out that one clearing you guys are in. So there's a couple ways to guide us in. The first we call the turn and stop. Tell me, turn to your left. Now we're going to start turning this way and stop. You're pointed at me. Okay, I've headed the right direction now. Turn to your right, okay, stop, you're pointed at me. That helps us kind of get into where you guys are at. Another method is the clock method. And we use this as from the pilot's perspective. So the nose of the aircraft is 12 o'clock, the tail of the aircraft is 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock is out the right side window, 9 o'clock is out the left side window. And if you can tell us I'm at your 9 o'clock, that lets me know that I need to turn this way because you're over here. What doesn't help me is when you say, okay, I see you, you're at my 12 o'clock. <laughs> well, I, I don't know which way you're facing. That doesn't help me. So everything is related to the aircraft orientation. I'm at your 9 o'clock, turn left. Nope, you've gone too far. Now I'm at your 6 o'clock, turn around. So in this position, you would tell the pilot that you are at his 3 o'clock position, and then he's going to know to turn right. Hmm. 